Hello everyone, welcome to this new episode on image segmentation with microscopy image browser and today I would like to introduce you a new deep learning workflow for uh, image segmentation in patches. Uh, the idea is that instead of doing uh, training of work on the images and the uh, models where uh, objects of interest are segmented, we will do the training uh, using patches. Uh, basically, the patches are small crops from the dataset that show examples of particular objects which you want to identify. So for example, uh, these images show lipid droplets, examples of lipid droplets. These images show example of mitochondria. And these images show examples of nuclear envelope. Uh, uh, in our case, today uh, we have a data set of Trypanosoma brucei uh, taken with serial block phase scanning electron microscopy. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to identify locations of nuclei on this data set. Um, the beauty of deep learning segmentation using patches is that you, do not, uh, you don't need to provide uh, a model where the objects of interest are segmented and this way you can do training or generate the uh, training set uh, very quickly. Uh, in addition the results can be used to identify for example whether you have this particular object in your data set and it can also be used as the guiding tool that uh, will guide you towards the particular location where you have uh, your object of interest. Uh, the ultimate result that we're going to get today is, will, be, will look something like this, where the green areas are showing detected nuclei, uh, the red boxes are showing locations of a background object, in this case these are like cells, and the white uh, areas are not, uh, uh, they were not used uh, during prediction due to dynamic masking, which is also a new mode that we have in Microscopy Image Browser. And if I show this model in 3D, then uh, it will look something like this. So you can see the volume and then these uh, boxes, uh, green boxes, they indicate locations of nuclei. And then we can guide our segmentation tools towards those areas and, for example, do the segmentation there using semantic segmentation approaches. How we start? Uh, we already preloaded a data set and now what we need to do, we need just to basically click inside each of our objects to kind of identify it. Uh, to do clicking, we will use annotation tool in MIB. So I select annotations and then I just zoom in to the nucleus of interest and type, for example, I call it anyway, like N due to nucleus. And then I need to click inside of nuclei that I see on my images. Um, now each time I click, uh, a prompt appear, and if I don't want to see it, I can uncheck this show prompt checkbox. This way, whenever I click, uh, a new label appears without the uh, additional uh, dialog. If I put the lab label somewhere else at the wrong place, for example here, I can hold the control key and use the left click to remove the, uh, the added label. And I can also use this uh, undo operation if needed. So uh, the idea is that what we do just basically going and click inside of the our object of interest. Uh, when we add added enough uh, annotations, we can click back show prompt and click somewhere else where we do not have nuclei and add it to a new material, which we can call PG, standing from background. And uh, continue adding those annotations. Uh, naturally, the more uh, annotations you add, uh, the better results you can expect. Uh, the annotations are available in this annotation list. And now I already have clicked 295 times and I have this uh, sequence of uh, background and uh, 
nucleus uh, labels. Now we need to crop these annotations to files. So to do that, I just need to select using the shift and click. I can select the first set, which is N to nuclei. Right click and in this drop down, uh, in this menu, I can select the crop out pages around selected annotations. Uh, in this dialog, I can select the format that I want to use for export and I can select the page size. So in this particular case, I will use 100 by 100 pixels and select output directory. Uh, as the output directory, I will make a new one, which, is, which I'll call one uh, train. And inside this, I'll make one more, which I called images. And under images, I'll need to create two subfolders, one that I will call to the nuclei and one that I call background. So this is going to be nuclei and I select this directory and when I press the crop button these uh, the patches 100 by 100 pixels will be generated now I'll repeat the process for the background so I go to train images uh, pg 100 by 100 it's also possible to crop 3d objects but uh, in this particular work workflow, we are working with 2D patches. So I update the view. And then now if I go to the train images, I'll have these two folders, so two subfolders. And if I open nuclei, you can see these are examples of these patches that we cropped out around the nuclei. And the same if I look into the page, uh, into BG. Oh, sorry. If we look this background patches, so these are the, just the different patches that are uh, taken, and then they will be used for training as the something that we don't want, or that we want to identify as the background class. Now, uh, what we also need to do now we need to actually resave this data set because now it was loaded from a single file we need to save it as the sequence of 2d files so i hit ctrl s uh, make a new folder which i call to pre predict here create the folder images and i'll save this now as the sequence of, uh, of 2d uh, Amira mesh files. You can use Steve for example if you want. So, but for now I just use this Amira mesh. Then what you can see here that uh, yeah, I'm creating this individual images. So these are just individual slices from this data set. Uh, to start uh, training, we need to start deep learning segmentation, which is available from the menu tools. If you used before DeepMeep for semantic segmentation, you already can notice that uh, we redesigned slightly uh, user interface. And now uh, you can see here that, uh, that in order to start, you need to select the workflow. And then under the workflow, you need to select an architecture. We have three different workflows, 2D and 3D semantic segmentation, which is basically when uh, each pixel in the predicted model belongs to one or another class and the patch wise where with prediction is done on the patches not on the actual images and the corresponding labels uh, in this training we will use the ResNet 18 which is the lightest uh, architecture it's quite quick to work with and it doesn't take lots of resources uh, in the first step uh, we need to specify the directories where we put the, tra the images that we will use for training so I go to this page wise, so where we have train directory and select this folder. The same for uh, predict. And then one more for results. So make a new folder, put uh, results. Uh, this doesn't really matter. I just to check it. Uh, before starting, we need to uh, our images are saved here under the images as BG and nuclei. So these are the two classes that would like to our network to be trained. 
but in order to start we actually need to split these images into two subfolders which is called uh, train images and validation images uh, by the way description of all the folders available on the help section there is directory and preprocessing panel and here for the different workflows uh, you can see the organization of directories. For example, here organization directories for 2D patchwise workflow, and here the directory tree. And uh, uh, what basically is needed, we need to have the directories named as train images and validation images. And as now we have only uh, just images, so we need to move to split the uh, pages that we have into these two subfolders and this can be done automatically by specifying the fraction of images that we would like to have in the train images oh sorry in the validation images subfolder and choosing split files for training and validation so I select this make sure that the extension is correct am am uh, and then I press preprocess the preprocess button when we do this uh, splitting, we can either move the files from the images subfolder, so we won't have any images subdirectory under the training, or we can uh, copy. So if I do copy now, uh, in the result, I'm gonna have the train images and validation images, but my original patches that I uh, initially stored in the images subfolder stay there so this directory won't be removed and uh, roughly we have 92% of images into the train images subfolder and 8% of images in the validation images subfolder next we go to the train the, to the train tab and in the train tab uh, we need to specify uh, the basic parameters uh, of our uh, network uh, this tab was redesigned and now basically it uh, all the parameters that are related to network design augmentation design and uh, training process are separated into these uh, three different sections the input page size we need to say put uh, the one that we specified which was 100 by 100 and for this training, for these networks, we need to use the three color channels. So the last uh, parameter here specifies how many color channels we have. Uh, in our images, we, our images are grayscale, but uh, during training and during prediction, the images will be automatically converted to RGB. Uh, and then we need to specify number of classes. So in our case, we're gonna have three classes. So background, uh, nuclei, and we also have to have like exterior, which would be not really used in this case, but uh, basically number of classes here should be two plus one. In fact, it will, they will be automatically identified, but uh, as we go through these uh, boxes, I just put three now. Um, then the rest probably is fine as it is. What we can do, we can also use ImageNet weights. And the image weight needs, uh, when it is checked, uh, then this ResNet network will be initialized. It will be pre-trained network rather than the network with the empty weights. And that would allow us to do to reach the uh, training way quicker. Uh, this checkbox is only available again in MATLAB version of MIP so far. So it means that if you use the same workflow without uh, uh, in the compiled version, then it will take just a bit longer then we can press the check uh, uh, network and that what we can get we can see something like this error messages which means that uh, the uh, we need to have the support package to install it press net uh, press net 18 Oops. press net 18 and then I can start this explorer and uh, using this uh, add-on explorer I can install the corresponding network when network is installed uh, I can use this image net weights so just accept this and installing the support package so the problem that I have here is actually that I 
I, 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 it's, I have several MATLAB installed in parallel and then they don't really happy with some of the buzzes. Okay, let's check the network. Yeah, so here is this ne network uh, scheme and we have all the layers and there's no errors. Uh, in this version of uh, DeepMip, we can use the various augmentations. For example, we extended 3D augmentation to the 18 augmentations in total. Uh, but again, as we working now with 2D, so we're just go going to check the 2D augmentation list. Uh, the way it works, uh, that we, we have these uh, parameters. The first parameter identify if there are two numbers, the first value identify whether this particular augmentation is triggered or not. And the second value uh, defines uh, a chance that this augmentation is triggered. So for example, now uh, we will, all patches that are coming to network will be augmented. Then there is 25% chance that the patch will be reflected in X direction. 25% chance that the page will be reflected in Y direction. The same for this rotation. Uh, then there is a, let's put it, uh, maybe 10% chance that we're going to have this random rotation 10 degrees. Uh, we can have also a scaling factor to make it like slightly bigger or slightly smaller, which is currently 5%. Uh, we can put the round uh, scale in X direction, scale in Y direction to 2%. We can have share. Uh, maybe 5%, which is fine. Uh, Gaussian noise, uh, probably also can introduce some, let's put it uh, maybe, well, it doesn't really matter, like 1%. It's the same data set, so the Gaussian noise is technically not really needed here. But if you have these multiple data sets, then you actually need to perhaps use some parameter here. Poisson noise, uh, hue and saturation jitter we won't use because we have a grayscale images. But what we can do also slightly add uh, brightness jitter and also we can add uh, a contrast jitter. But again, very small numbers in this particular case because we, uh, uh, we, we're working with the same data set eventually. But if you have images coming from the different modalities, you can change these parameters uh, to make them to have larger variation and larger probability. And maybe I put here as well some kind of small value for image blur. But honestly, these parameters are not really needed that much. More like this and then this uh, scaling and then uh, share would be more important. We can also preview parameter. So uh, we can select a class, let's say nuclei. And out of all these augmentations, we can really select one that we want to check. For example, uh, let's test the uh, run rotation. And uh, what it will do, it will generate this number of patches that we can specify using the settings and show us the variation. And the variation, uh, I forgot to mention here. So basically these two numbers are specifying the variation. So now we have plus minus uh, 10 degrees for the rotation. And now it shows 16 pages, picking a random value from each of these, uh, between the, uh, these values. Uh, right, next uh, we continue and then we specify mini batch size. So mini batch size is how many uh, images, patches are directed at the same time to the network for training. And it's purely depends on what kind of GPU you have. Uh, well, random seed generator is it's good to use like some kind of fixed number, uh, not zero, but any fixed number. In this case, you can get some reproducible uh, training result if you restart the training. In the training tab, uh, we can also go through the different settings. You can select number of epochs, let's say 300, uh, shuffling. Basically, these are pretty much default parameters. And then we can pick up uh, as the output output network, we can pick up the best validation loss. And what we can also do in the release 2022, we can also specify a uh, frequency of saving 
checkpoint networks. So uh, when the network trained, after each five epochs, it it will create a kind of snapshot file so that uh, if it for some reason crash, we can open that network file and can continue from that point. And now we can specify what would be the frequency of saving this. We can also export the training plots, but I won't do it now. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, that's it for now. And then, uh, okay. Oh yeah, we need to specify the the file name for our network. So let's name it something like that. We have this ResNet uh, 18 uh, that we have 100 pixel uh, page size. And that's what we're gonna train it for uh, 300 epochs. And then we hit the train button. So we need to confirm to make sure that our images in the train images train and validation images subfolder and then press the uh, OK button. So uh, the training will take a while. And uh, here we see the progress plot where the input patches are shown here. The frequency of this process, like how many patches are shown, uh, can be specified in the options tab here. Uh, at the moment we have 2% of patches that are going to network are visualized. But naturally what you can do, you can of course decrease this value. In this case the training will be uh, kind of quicker. The training will take some time and while doing this, uh, we can relax, make some tea or take a cup of coffee or a nap. And now I'll just do fast forward and then return back to this uh, when the training is finished. Welcome back. The training is over now. It took us eight or nine minutes to do the training. Uh, here the green line is showing the validation, the point or network iteration that was actually selected as the final network output. And perhaps here you should be a little bit more careful. Uh, depending what's the percentage of these images that are used for validation, perhaps the validation set may not really show the very good uh, kind of representation of images that you actually have in your data set. In that sense, it may not necessarily mean that this is the best option uh, to pick up. If you have relatively large uh, validation set, then it's probably a very good idea to pick up this one. Otherwise, we can take always the last one. And uh, again, this parameter is specified here, like either we take the last iteration or we take the, take the best validation loss, which I have for this particular case. Right. So now uh, we can go to the following tab, which is called uh, predict. And here uh, what was uh, got, uh, we changed is that uh, now we, there is an option to select a prediction engine. All previous versions of DeepMeep were using this legacy engine, but now I highly recommend to use this block image option because it's way more uh, flexible and gives more options and it's, it's the one that just, uh, uh, will be developed further. And uh, anyway, this patchwise mode is not available in the legacy mode, so you can't really use it. So uh, we select the blocked image mode and the first option that we can specify is the percentage of overlapping tiles. Uh, the idea is that when you do the prediction, you uh, you do it uh, also in this patchwise mode, you do it in tiles. So basically you, you, you have an image, then you have, that's gonna be your first tile, like here. Then if there is no overlap, then the next tile will be like here. If there is an overlap, let's say like now 40%, then uh, the the tile will be kind of like that. So the area that the tile that is gets predicted is overlapping between the two tiles, and uh, it is good uh, because uh, in the standard mode in semantic segmentation, uh, we may have an artifact at the edges of the tiles. And in the patchwise uh, segmentation, for example, if the structure of interest will be at the edge here, it may not be really very well uh, recognized. 
So it's good to use some kind of overlapping, uh, certain overlapping percentage. Uh, what we also can have now, we can have this dynamic masking. Let me show you how it works. Uh, pressing this uh, setting buttons, we can specify what would be the policy of doing this dynamic masking. The idea is that uh, when the block is uh, selected, it's going to be thresholded, and then depending on this parameter, it will be processed using deep learning uh, architecture that we have, or will be skipped. In the specialized workflow, it's not really that much beneficial. Probably you can gain like maybe 10, maybe 15 to 20 percent. Again, depending which architecture you're using, but in for more complex architectures, the the, the actual benefit will be more uh, significant. So uh, okay, so here we have a darker objects. So we would like to uh, keep the objects, keep the patches for prediction below a, a certain threshold value, and uh, let's say the value is like our background here is about hundred. 90 200 so maybe we can put like i know 175 and we can put a certain percentage um, of pixels that uh, have this value in the page and then we can preview it so i can zoom into any area i like and uh, then i can hit the this uh the i button and then it will show us what would be the basically the patches that will be picked so you can see here that the estimate is quite good and if I, for example, change it to, let's say, 200 and then preview, then it will take actually take everything. So it won't do any of this dynamic masking. So I guess in this sense, this 175 was pretty good uh, estimate. Uh, the next parameter that we can specify is the number of uh, uh, patches that are processed at the same time. And again, it depends on the particular GPU that you have. Uh, in the patchwise mode, we can also upsample prediction. So uh, in, by default, uh, each patch will give one single number. But if we tick this checkbox, then the resulting image will be the same size as the size of the, our data set, and we can easily visualize it by overlapping the, uh, the generated models. Uh, we can also specify what kind of format we want to have. For now, I'll just use the MIP format and where we want to have the score files. Uh, let's put not generate. Uh, and then we hit uh, predict. So uh, we need to make sure that the images are stored in predict images. And that's what we did uh, when we originally exported our images in 2D. So I created a folder under the predict images. That's, uh, and uh, those images will be processed. So I press the predict button and then prediction started. Uh, in this particular case, the prediction is slightly not optimized because our uh, page size is relatively small. And then when we have the, for example, now I put the overlap as 40%, it kind of will take a while. So it, it will take about this 10 minutes to predict this, the full data set. Uh, in many other cases, in, if this input page size is larger, then of course and, uh, it will process the things uh, way quicker. So let's fast forward from here. Prediction is finished now and what we can do, we can hit this load images and models button to load the ones. Let's just click to another container, clear it, press load images and models. Uh, I can do this if I use this upsample prediction. In this case, our predictions matching the size of our uh, data set and we can load them. And here we can see this basically this, uh, the results which is similar to the one that I showed in the uh, animation before starting. So the uh, locations of nuclei identified as this nuclei class. The red color shows the background uh, class and the white areas, those that were skipped due to the dynamic masking. Let's explore a little bit what we have in the results. Uh, in the results, we have the score networks. So these are these uh, checkpoint networks that are generated because we had the, we have this uh, save checkpoint networks file, uh, well, ticked. And uh, those are basically, we can continue from any of those if the training crashes. Uh, now we have these prediction images. We have no scores because I actually I didn't 
output to generate it, them. Uh, and in the result models, we have two kinds of data. First, we have this comma separated file. Uh, let's open this. And we have it for each image. So what it basically has, it has the uh, a map that, that encodes, uh, let's say, so this is the first slice. Okay, actually, let's see, we, we can open slice 270, the one that we have now opened. Let's see, so we scroll to 270. So here there's a table where each uh, cell indicates the coordinates of the corresponding block. So here we have like one, probably two, three, four, five blocks that are empty and block number six should have should belong to class two or class uh, class one, sorry, because this is background. So then here we can have basically the same. So this is basically like a low resolution image uh, of, of this one. And the second file is the is the dot model file. It's the actual model that I visualizing here as this overlay. Uh, if we generate the score files, then those will be here and then there. Uh, they show the probability of each class belongs uh, to this specific area. Uh, we can also can evaluate segmentation. If you would have uh, in the predict folder, if we have uh, labels here, then we can use this evaluate segmentation in order to find out what was the percentage of the uh, how, how correct was the prediction. So that's pretty much about the patchwise segmentation. Uh, it could be useful for multiple uh, workflows, for example, uh, just really if you need to find out whether or not you have this particular object in your data set. Uh, and uh, it's relative, relatively quickly to do. So with this, I'm stopping now and thank you very much for your attention. Bye bye.